次。听Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Tassa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo sadanto suche doye olahudi samyao sanputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa by qian wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou chi. Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi, supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a million eons. But now we see and hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, good evening. Welcome to our sutra lecture tonight. Jin Ho Shi, is the volume okay in the back? Can you hear it? A little bit louder, yeah. It seems a little on the soft side. That's rare. Usually we're on the, the uh, loud side. Today we pump it up a little bit. So my name is Hung Shur. We're here in Berkeley, California. And we're about to launch into our sutra lecture tonight, the eighth ground, the eighth stage of the Bodhisattva's ten stages in the Flower Garland Sutra. Hua Yan Jing Shi Di Ping De Di Ba Di Zui Ho Ji Ji Song. I appreciate that some of you have driven up from Santa Clara, my goodness. Some of you drove up from Scotts Valley earlier. Uh, some of you came further, further, Any, anywhere else. Some all the way from Oakland, California, can you imagine? Crossing from there to here. And uh, we're going to be looking into the sutra. Let's begin, as people get settled, by chanting the title on the sutra. The cover of our text has the name of the Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. This is uh, just just for what it's worth. I have here in front of me the uh, Dharma instruments that we have used for years and years and years when we do this chanting, and they go namo da like that, right? You know, and he like that. That's the familiar way, and we do it in Chinese. Um, We've been innovating since March in Australia when we recited the uh, Avatamsaka Sutra from start to finish. And as a, a way to honor Master Shenhua's uh, centennial, this is the 100th year of Master Hua's birth. And at that time, we started doing it with a banjo doing the same chanting in Chinese, and people seem to like it. 
Uh, at the time, I had a, a lovely fretless nylon string banjo, and we had a, a three-year-old who every time I played the banjo, she was listening at home, she would start to dance in her apartment. And her parents took, picked, took a movie of this three-year-old waiting for the banjo to start so she could dance around to the sound. Now, I suppose that's okay, or, you know, three-year-olds dancing to the name of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. What, what could be better, right? So, so uh, that's a, uh, a vote of a thumbs up, I think, in the virtual world. If you can start the three-year-olds dancing with your banjo, you're doing good. So, so uh, let's see what we think about it here in Berkeley, California. It's there in the cover, and you say, Namo Da Fang Guang Fu, Hua Yin Jing, Hua Yin Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa. The melody, in fact, is the very same melody that I used when I was doing my bowing pilgrimage, which some of you may have heard about, but it's neither here nor there. But this, this melody was part of my life for eight hours every day for, for almost three years, but never on the banjo. So this is kind of new to me too. Here we go. There we start, right? Namo. Here we go. Namo da fang guang fu hua yin ji hua yin hai wei go bu sa namo da fang fu hua yin. Imagine in the future the requisites of the monk, three robes, bowing cloth, a bowl, and a banjo, right? <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. so. Okay, so the point of that is to invoke spiritual presence, to welcome them here. Here in Berkeley, California, today is actually Sunday, August, Saturday, August 11th. This is the first day of the lunar seventh month. So that day is a, a special day. We'll talk about that later tonight, what's, what's involved. I wanted to express appreciation as we get going to folks. Number one, we have a Vietnamese translation happening up in the balcony. If anybody would like to hear a Vietnamese translation. Further, uh, due to the generosity of our tech team, we've got a camera here with our trained photographic, videographic tech folks recording me and sending me over to the computer team, which is going out to YouTube Live. Dharma Realm Live is the name of our channel. And GoToMeeting is also broadcasting it live over to Australia, where another branch of our team is taking the English webcast translating it into Mandarin and sending that out over yy.com to China, leaping over the great Chinese firewall by, by that act. So we really appreciate everybody's help in making this go further. 
I'd like to invite you to turn, please, to page 46 and 47. Jerry will help people listening in online find that text online. You can find it at berkeleymonastery.org and he'll add the uh, address so people can download our English translation of this sutra. On page 46 and 47, we're on stanza 1, 2, 3, 4. San qian shi jie si da zhong. And using the four elements. Everybody find it? Got what you need? Okay, let's read the Chinese. I'll give you a line, you give it back. San qian shi jie si da zhong. 六去众生身隔别，六去众生身隔别，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众宝微尘数，吉义众
be the early bird to get the worm so you could eat the worm for yourself and not share the worm with the other birds who get up later. Mm. The three bodies, they won't... You, you may get liberation, but it's not the same. There's a, there are levels. So this is the highest level. This is the bodhisattva path, unselfish. With that in mind, what does it say? Sanqian shi jie su da zhong. The translation in English is a mistake. We're looking at a mistake. It's a typo. The four elements in a threefold thousand world system. It came out as a three thousand fold world system. Wrong. It's not a fold. There's no such thing as a fold world, right? So it's a three fold thousand world system. And four elements in the various bodies of six destinies. Two lines, we got three numbers. Buddhism by the numbers. What's it talking about? It's taking us into the bodhisattva's division bodies. How do you do it when this thing appears, when you can teach people? How does it work? This is about as close a description as I've ever read of what it must be like when these responses are working for you. And wait a minute. We're going to get to the next page to the top. And there's an even better, clearer image of how this must work. Okay? So, four elements, earth, air, fire, water. That's the components of this gadget, right? This thing. Male, female, young, old. Made up of four elements. In the three-fold thousand-world system, that's a name for universe. So, anywhere. In other words, anywhere that there's a body, earth, air, fire, and water, in the bodies of beings in the six destinies, means anywhere in the world. Throughout the universe, anywhere in the world, there's a body made up of earth, air, fire, and water, and in the multitudes of jewels to the number of dust particles, talking about world systems, you can see it all. No exception. Okay? I just reinterpreted this phrase this uh, quatrain, okay? With wisdom, you can see it all. They say it's just like an, an iPhone on the palm of your hand. They used to say an apple. We don't, how many times do you get to see an apple on the palm of your hand? Well, maybe, but iPhones like every minute, right? So just as clearly as an iPhone in the palm of your hand, as clearly as a wooden fish in the palm of your hand. That's how clear all those bodies in all those worlds are, just like that. Okay, many numbers, but don't be put aside by the numbers. Don't be put off by the numbers. Pusa neng zhi yi che shen wei hua zhong sheng tong bi xing, guo du wu liang zhong zhong bie, xi wei xian xing wu bu bian. The Bodhisattva knows each and every body, and to transform these beings takes on shapes like theirs in limitlessly many lands with all their differences. He makes his forms appear, omitting none. This is what's going on with that three bodies. And the numbers that are reported here are pretty staggering. No matter who it is in a world, no matter how big the Bodhisattva, if the conditions are there, can go there, appear, and teach. Okay? So, does that make, you know, how do you hear that? Some people might go, nah, nah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, nod your head, yeah, what else? You know, no big deal. Other people go, what in the world? Who, who, who could imagine such a thing? <coughs> Jerry. Somebody wants to know about the merit of the Universal Door chapter and how to recite it. Um, in a different lecture, I would be happy to respond. Not now. If I, right? Because if I did that, I mean, I could, but that would be 
That wouldn't be the Avatamsaka Sutra lecture. What I will say is, go find a copy of the Lotus Sutra. The Fa Hua Jing, open to chapter 25 and discover for yourself. Right? That's what you should do. Go find out for yourself. It's, we, uh, at the city of 10,000 Buddhas, they did it every day for a week last week. So ask anybody who was there how it's done. Uh, the merits of it are infinite. It's Guanyin Bodhisattva's compassion. People chant it, people bow to it, people translate it, people write it out, people embroider covers for it, people memorize it, people explain it. Lots of ways to cultivate it. But respectfully, I decline because that would be another lecture. Okay. Come back next week. Come back some other week and we'll do the Puman Pin. What I will say, though, is that the Puman Pin explains this, how Guanyin Bodhisattva does it, can appear in all different forms. Okay, so what, you know, here we are, scientific age, um, when if I want, uh, let's say, let's pick one. Suppose I want um, WeChat. Mm. Suppose I want Facebook mm. or Twitter or WhatsApp or Line or iMessage. I go to the blue icon and tap that. And I have been trained as an Apple product consumer that all I have to do is hit that little magnifying glass, type in, and if I go get, I will own a copy of whatever app that was as long, just as quickly as it takes, go like that, it's mine. To me, because I've, used, I've been using smartphones ever since my Palm Pilot way back when, that's no big deal. It's like, I expect that. Don't, I got one. Wait a minute. Mm, there we go. Oh, no Wi-Fi. Oh, shoot. What's the Wi-Fi? Okay, now I got it, right? I expect that's going to happen, and it's no problem, right? Ten years ago, if I'd explained that to somebody, they would have said, no, you're dreaming. What world is that happening in? No way, right? We've come to assume that's just no big deal whatsoever. How quickly we adjust to this whole... and. That's true for me and it's true for any one of you in the, you know, Apple iPhone ecosystem. Or if you're an Android user, the Google Play, you can download infinite copies of these functioning. Then you tap it and it does all the things that you expect that app to do. For us, that's like, yeah, that, that's what happens, right? Why is that normal? When we look at this and go, no, that's just completely nonsense. I've never heard of it. Does science know about this? Is, is it real? You know? And yet, what's being described is the very same thing, which is this bodhisattva is able to appear infinitely in forms geared to living beings' needs as many as necessary. Right? So, is it the same as downloading an iPhone app? Probably not. But we can get a if we can understand something that we've now assumed is the new normal, maybe this would be equally, you know, huh, okay, sure, that's what bodhisattvas do. Okay, another, maybe even a better, a better example would be, suppose uh, you discovered that, um, let's say, the 49ers are playing an exhibition game and you discovered that it was on KCBS and you wanted to, maybe you're, you're one of those perverse people who likes to watch the 49ers lose, right? So maybe you're a masochist and so you think, I'll watch that. So you, you know, get in KCBS and you can watch the 49ers, you know, try to find a quarterback that doesn't get hurt or doesn't, you know, uh, cause the team to, uh, to check their franchise again and see whether they shouldn't move to San Jose or something. Um, you can ask for KCBS, ask for the program, 
There it is. We get to watch the 49ers. And 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people who have the device and get the right call letters can expect the same thing to happen. We understand that's normal, right? Why would you expect anything different? Because why? We've been trained that that's, that's going to happen. I'm going to suggest that we live in a world where this function, which would be in every respect more natural, more normal than having a device that can watch a football game broadcast through the air. <coughs> For the bodhisattva, he or she doesn't have to depend on anything external whatsoever. No TV needed, no computer monitor needed. It's all innate. It's completely there waiting for us to empower it through precepts, samadhi, wisdom, and more importantly, vows. The bodhisattvas wish to teach. That's the key. That's the equipment you need to be able to boot up this huashan, these transformed bodies. And that's, that's a pretty good analogy, actually. If you have to dig up an analogy of what it might be like for this to happen, Thinking that, you know, downloading, going on to media and watching entertainment that way. Netflix, if you want to watch, uh, you know, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise, number one, two, three, four, five, five, I think, and this is the new one, is six or something, and it happens to be on Netflix, any number of people who are subscribed can expect to watch that movie. Why is that normal? And this is strange. Okay, so... The Bodhisattva knows each and every body and the transformed those beings appears like them in limitlessly many lands with all their differences. He makes his forms appear omitting none. Now how he does it, that's another story. But that it happens shouldn't be a surprise. If we can accept that, you know, downloading social media is so amazing. It's no longer amazing. It's so normal. Okay, please flip over. Page 48, 49. Piru Like the moon, which remains in empty space, while its reflection appears in water everywhere, in the Dharma realm he rests unmoving, while reflections of him appear according to beings' thoughts. Okay, this is peeking behind the curtain, right? Remember Wizard of Oz? Oh, who was I asking the other day? We were, I think we were at Buddha Root Farm, and I said to somebody, it's just like Wizard of Oz, remember? And they went, no. I hadn't seen it. <laughs> really? There's a living, breathing human being who has not seen Wizard of Oz. You have not seen the Wizard of Oz? I have seen it. You have seen? Everybody's seen Wizard of Oz. Including our young senor. Yeah. How about that? What a good movie, right? Yeah. Are you, okay. It was first a book. Frank Baum. Right? Remember the flying monkeys? If I only had a brain. Says who? Who says that? Who sings if I only had a brain? The scarecrow. If I only had a heart. Who says that? The tin man. If I only had courage. Says the cowardly lion. Yeah, yeah. See? There we go. It's, it's part, of our, part of our folklore. It's part of our literature. Right? And if you grew up in Taiwan and didn't get to see Wizard of Oz, you better see it in the next week because you're missing something quite wonderful. And interestingly enough, some people are staring, what is he talking about? Interestingly enough, when the Wizard of Oz was first released, it was panned. People said, what a foolish waste of time. The reviewer for the New York Times panned it. That it was just absolutely not going to, this, this, this movie is destined to sink, right? Well, it became one of the most beloved 
movies of all time. Gorjan, have you seen Wizard of Oz? Wizard of Oz? Yes? No? Ask, okay, ask Julia. Julia will fill you in. So. The Wizard of Oz. Okay, so I asked somebody at Buddha Root Farm, and they said, no, I haven't seen it. And I, I, was, I had a great analogy I was going to launch to explain a point. It was like, oh, shoot, I assume that everybody has seen Wizard of Oz. So, um, the, she clicks the red shoes, you know. There's no place like home. There's no place like home, says Dorothy, right? I'm melting, melting, says the Wicked Witch of the West, of the North, South, South, right? West, okay, West. Mm. So, like the moon, which remains in space while its reflections appear in water everywhere, in the Dharma realm, he rests unmoving while reflections of him appear according to beings' thoughts. How did we get to the Wizard of Oz? It was the wizard behind the curtain, right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, he says. And Toto goes over and grabs the curtain and pulls it away. Did the Wizard of Oz make it to Poland in a Polish? No, okay. We'll have to fix that. We've got to get you to see the Wizard of Oz. I bet there's a Polish dubbing translation. Yeah. So, anyway, Toto pulls the curtain aside, and oh, here's the wizard moving the levers and causing the, the smoke. I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Right? And the cowardly lion <laughs> runs out of the palace. So, likewise, when the curtain is pulled back and we see what's going on, this particular four-line verse says something about what's going on here. How does this work? Okay, we've established that it can work, at least if we're, we're reserving our judgment. But how does it work? How does he respond to everybody's particular needs? And who is that masked bodhisattva, you know? Is, is it the person sitting right beside you here in the Buddha Hall? Could it be your mom? Could it be your spouse? You know, could it be your enemy who you can't stand? Who's really the bodhisattva there to bring you face to face with your prejudices and your biases? Maybe. So, what is it revealing? The moon is just one. But if you have a teacup full of water, and it's not the new moon, it's a full moon. Not, tonight's the new moon. And you hold that teacup out at midnight when the full moon is overhead, there's a perfect moon reflected in the teacup, right? If you've got 10 teacups full of water, you've got 10 perfect moon reflections. That's so amazing. There's only one in the sky, but there's 10 perfect. Now, the tricky part is, suppose you have a bowl, a soup bowl, or a bowl, a pho bowl, right? And you've got, you hold your pho bowl there. Guess what appears in the pho bowl? A pho bowl full of moon. You can't eat it. You keep, you know. But there it is. And it's, if you have a beef soup, you know, bowl there. If you've got a cooking pot, a, a wok full of water, you've got a wok size moon right there. And as many woks full of water as you have, that's how many walks full of moon you have, right? If you have a thimble, you got a thimble-sized moon. A hundred thimbles, a hundred thimble-sized moon. So, that's interesting, right? So, could that be how the bodhisattva appears in each living being's different nature to teach them? Something like that. What is it? According to being's thoughts. Now, the deal is, the work had to be done while the Bodhisattva was meditating, before he ever got to this stage where I'm ready to teach. Can you imagine how many hours on the cushion, with knees on fire, did it take for the Bodhisattva to be so sensitive that whatever you're thinking reflects on his water or her water? 
right? The bodhisattva cannot be thinking about what he's going to have for dinner after lecture, right? I wonder if that pizza place is still open after 9.30. What time do they finish? Let's see. Well, we could probably, I think, mm, I know there's a taco place down on university. Maybe we can go get some tacos. If you got that thought, no matter what the person is thinking beside you, it's not going to register on your water, right? So for this to happen, for the moon of the bodhisattva's awareness to appear correctly, accurately reflecting what you're thinking, his or her water has to be really still and pure. So to change the language, you'd have to be not false thinking. Right? You can't have false thoughts in your mind if you intend to pick up somebody else's subtle, sensitive thoughts. How, sen- how strong is a thought broadcast in my mind? Mm. I just did on like kilohertz. Is it like a microwave beam? Cell phone? Is it a Bluetooth beam? Right? This, this device has apparently, what, six radios in it? It's got a GPS radio. It's got a cell phone, which is microwave radio. It's got a Bluetooth radio. It's got a, a what is, how do uh, modems communicate to each other? What kind of broadcast? It's got a radio radio, radio broadcast, FM and AM, right? All these different devices inside that will pick up subtle subtle wavelength differences and get them correctly so that the station you want comes in, right? Or the password protected uh, mm, Wi-Fi signal that you're counting on shows up, all right? What about a thought in your mind? What if the person that you want to reflect because you're the bodhisattva and you're going to teach somebody what if they speak Polish and you get a French broadcast, right? Or what if, like, Tao, you speak French and Dutch and English and Vietnamese, and I only speak French, and she's like, she doesn't speak French, no, Dutch. I only speak Dutch and she's broadcasting in English. Does it get mixed up? It doesn't get mixed up. It's correct. How quiet does your mind have to be for this to work? And when is that work, that quieting of the mind done? It's done in what's called the yin ti, the stage of causation, while you are cultivating. That's when this work has to be done. And so every period of meditation counts. You can't skip them, or you're going to have static on your radio, and I'm not going to know what you're thinking. So imagine, I mean, just by comparison. For me, my, when I meditate, it's not so much the pain, it's the murky. Mine is not diao ju, it's hun chen. The affliction that I have when I meditate is... Hmm? And it's, you know, oh, you know. So for me, getting that broadcast is... <laughs> It's murky, murky, murky. But this bodhisattva, I mean, you compare what an accomplishment this is to quiet your mind so that, like the moon in the sky shining, I catch that image perfectly and reflect it back. And then, not only that, it's not just a static image, it's whatever is happening in the mind of a living being who I hope to teach, I can catch the subtle, 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 subtle fluctuations of their thoughts and response. Profound, right? You have to be 99 and 44 when 100% pure to do that. Very cool. Okay, please, on your bowing cushion, you should have one of these. Folks online, grab a copy. Page 11.
Look down at number 34. The one that's in italics because I haven't really translated it thoroughly yet to match the meter of the others. It goes like this. Yi xing yuan tong yi che xing yi fa bian han yi che fa yi che shui yue yi yue she yu wo ling jiao he let's see yi che shui yue yi yue she zhu fo fa shen ru wo xing wo xing tong gong ru lai he yi di ju zu yi che di Fei xing, fei si, fei xing yue. Tan zhi yan cheng ba wan men. Let's see. Tan zhi yan cheng ba wan men. Cha na mie che san qi ye. Yi che shu ju, fei shu ju. Yu wo ling jiao he jiao she. That's how it goes. Okay, that's 34, 35, 36. Take a look. One nature completes every nature. One dharma contains all dharmas. One moon, typo moon, one moon shines at once in all waters and every shining moon returns to just one moon. There's our same image from the Song of Enlightenment. The dharma body of all Buddhas fills my nature. My nature shares alike with all the scum ones. One ground completes all ground. One stage completes all stages. It's not form. It's not mind. It's not karma bound. 80,000 dharmas finished in a finger snap. Three countless eons of karma are gone when you blink your eye. Endless words and phrases have no meaning at all. They're totally unrelated to this magical awakening. Okay. That's power phrases from somebody who understands it, Master Yong Jia, from the Tang Dynasty. Okay, so I, when I saw this, like the moon remaining in empty space while its reflections appear in water everywhere, I thought, oh, where have I heard that before? That's right here in our Song of Enlightenment, right? So, he's, he, what does he say? He says, one moon shines at once in all waters, and further, every shining moon returns back to the moon and the sky. What I like about that is the pulsing of it, the boom, 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 boom. Anytime it has a heartbeat in it, it's the Dharma. It's alive. It's that moon reflects down here limitlessly bowls of pho or cups of water or glasses of milk or whatever, coffee, cups of coffee, and back it goes to the single moon. That I like, when I feel that kind of bump bump. It's both wonderful existence and perfect emptiness at the same time. That's when it makes sense to me. So, notice the key word here. In the Dharma realm, he rests unmoving. We're back to the sutra now. Resting unmoving in the Dharma realm. That's the key. I said purity that you have to do to get that. Here the sutra gives us budong as the criteria to be able to pick up everybody's, everybody's thoughts and respond to them and teach them in a transformation body. So when I say this is like pulling back the curtain like the Wizard of Oz, we see, oh, behind the curtain there's somebody pulling the levers. This is a little bit of a hint about what's actually going on in these transform, transform bodies. Jerry. Yeah. Can you reach this state of quiet mind only through meditation or through recitation or through bowing? I'll let you know when I get there. All right. So stay online. It may be a matter of lifetimes. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Um, my image of the three Buddhas on the altar behind me, are they're all doing that. And in theory, it should make no difference. In practice, sitting is what Buddhas do when they wake up. 
Why? Well, it has to do with that moving part. When you're sitting in full lotus, and Master Hua and generations of Chan masters say full lotus is the way, when you're sitting there, you are geometrically very stable. Right? If you can look at the, the three Buddhas sitting on the altar there, they're unmoving, right? They're stable. A triangle, a pyramid doesn't wiggle. It, boom. It's wider at the bottom, narrower at the top. Boom, it's there, right? Then you can also draw a circle around their bodies and you see, ah, perfectly positioned. And if you look from above, there's a square. It's just geometrically full lotus is really stable. It accords with nature. Um, so as a result, you can sit really still that way. And if you're standing, if you're bowing, um, is the mind quiet? Ultimately, if the mind is quiet, you could be doing anything. You could be swimming and you're still perfectly in samadhi. But as somebody who never got to that place while bowing, where Master Hua said, you want to bow to an empty space Buddha, he said. You want to bow to a Dharma realm Buddha, he said. You want to bow to the place where Tung, Qing, Yi, Ru, he said. Bow to the place where movement and stillness become one continuity, one Ru, the Ru of Rulai, one thusness. And I have to say I never did. For me, bowing was a lot of movement. So, Jerry, theoretically it should be possible. Master Hua kept pushing me in that direction, but I never have to say I didn't get there. Because for me it was always, you know, watching what I was bowing on. Was I bowing on glass? Was I bowing on dog poop? Was I bowing over, you know, pebbles? I had to adjust. I had to pay attention to all the feedback. And did that car go by me a third time? The first two times they shouted out the window, hey, loser, what are you doing kissing the ground? Here they come again. Maybe I should tighten, you know. I was responding to everything going on and my mind was moving, you know. And so if uh, the, 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 the answer to the question is sitting no different than sitting the only way to get to that stillness. It is one very good way to get to that stillness. If the question is the only way to answer that question, I would have had to try all three, right? And, mm, so I, I'm not really qualified to answer. Um, if your mind is in samadhi, san mei, yo ding li, then it doesn't matter. You're, you're there already, you know. But the problem is you're controlling eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the trickiest one, the mind. And the mind is like a monkey, right? Grabbing a banana, and then one banana is not enough, it wants the other banana. And then it sees a third banana, it drops that banana to grab that, but still I got two, you know. Monkeys. That's what the, the mind is like. So, why don't ask the question to try it and let us know how it works. Certainly this bodhisattva is unmoving and there is a time in meditation where you can actually feel yourself shifting gears. Just think of a car, right? You shift out of fourth into overdrive if you have a stick shift and, right? And what's it like? Pain in the knees is a good friend in meditation because it hurts to the point where you think I'm just gonna sit still because every time I wiggle it hurts more so you just sit really still and sure enough it's like you shift in another gear and the pain goes away it's it the pressure of knee pain can get you through what's called the pain gate movement never will and there's this amazing moment when you realize that it's the movement of the mind that is causing the pain in the knee. And if you can stop your thoughts, that it's like suddenly, oh, you're just, there's a, mm, 
you're in harmony suddenly. So, um, sitting in full lotus in meditation is the traditional method for entering samadhi. So, that's my theoretical answer to a theoretical question. But unmoving is the, is the way, stillness. The uh, higher levels of the dhyanas, chan, first, second, third, and fourth, happen when your heart stops and your breathing stops. Talk about stillness, unmoving, right? That's where our bodhisattva has gone through transformation from consciousness to wisdom. How still is the wisdom? It's like a mirror. Mirrors don't wiggle, right? And that's your body and your mind that have changed. What's the most moving thing? Mm, love and hate. Love and hate will move you, right? Fear will move you. Why? Emotion. Emotions, right? Oh, how could she possibly say that to me? That, I won't say. She's just, you know, she wore the same sweater that I wore and it looked better on her than it did on me. I hate her. Right? And it's like, oops, <laughs> no meditation for you. you know? Painful meditation, because you're like, ooh, looking out, comparing, thinking, looking back. Oh, you, oh, oh. So, emotion. Qi nu ai ju ai wu yu qi qing, seven qi go, qi zhong gui, they say, seven kinds of ghosts. Love, hate, she knew. Love, happiness, anger, sorrow, fear, love, hate, and desire. The seven emotions. They make us move. You know, you're meditating and you're thinking, oh, I just can't wait till this meditation period is over because then I'll dare check my phone to see whether she sent me any text messages while we were sitting. You know, you look down, ching, oh, good, there's one. You know, can't wait. See, did he fall asleep? No, okay, we're still sitting, okay. Oh, there's another one. You know, text messages from your beloved. And it's, you know, you, that's what makes the world go round. And it's, it's a good thing. We're not slamming, you know, love and affection. But we're talking about getting to this place of unmovingness so that you can be so subtle that other people's thoughts register and you know how to respond. What kind of stillness does that take? Here it is. And the amazing thing is, anybody can. Most people don't want to. Think of what you let go of to be able to get to this place where you can actually respond. Pretty, pretty amazing. Unselfish. Okay, so far so good. Am I just rolling on here with like trying to describe a state that I've never... <coughs> this... Are, these are the uh, four. Jin Hoshir. We have a question? Mm. Please. Gotta speak into the mic there so we can hear you. Not on? Her mic, isn't it? Which, which number is that? The red star. If you just shout, I can probably hear you too. But it has to be in English, not Dutch. I can't do Dutch. There we go. Yay. Okay. So you were talking about um, the emotion, like the thoughts. Uh, for me, the thoughts, the normal, the, uh, it normally starts with words in my head, right? And there's image, but there's also a feeling. So for hatred, like you were saying about the sweater, and you think about the words, and there's an image, and uh, there's a feeling. So what I think about if it's hatred, then I just try to stop thinking about the words, so the image will go away and the feeling will go away, right? Mm, right, you're asking me That's to That's what I well, would do. In theory, maybe, okay. In theory. Continue, yeah. Okay. So I was not thinking about hatred, but about love. Love. 
for me, normally love st starts with a feeling and not with words. So I was... <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Take your time. Okay, so sometimes I just... We've got Kleenexes right here. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. There you go. So I was, I was thinking, like, <laughs> if I... Sometimes I just fill up with love without thinking or images. And I was just, like, when you were... <laughs> Lecturing, I was just confused, like, should I then not feel love? Because I was confused if, because mm. love is also an emotion. Okay, I, let me talk to that, okay. The, what we're describing here is uh, an eight-stage bodhisattva. This is somebody who is really close to being a Buddha. And they, the way it's described is it takes lifetimes of work to get to an eight-stage bodhisattva. What kind of work has gone on here? This is somebody who only because of love has gotten to this place. But they don't use the word love. They would say compassion. And the difference between... The bodhisattva on the eighth stage, I'm guessing, and your mom, uh, is that this bodhisattva feels the same feelings that a mom feels for you, your mom feels for you, for all living beings, for everybody, even people that we would decide we don't like today. You know, no exceptions, no exceptions, and that's not just a way of saying it; it's real. So. For the bodhisattva, the difference would be, let's say a mom, bless their hearts. I mean, there's nothing better, more powerful than a mother's love. This is not romantic, eros, erotic love. This is agape, philios. All these love in English is four letters that includes the whole gamut of feelings of love. Okay. So erotic love is romance. Boy and girl, boy and boy, girl and girl, you know, human and dog, you know, that kind of love. Human and cat, if you're a cat lover. It also includes, what? It also includes agape, which is, often they describe Jesus' love in the Bible um, as being a sense of connection and a wish to end suffering. So that's, it's not romantic. It's not, there's no body involved. There's no possession involved. But there's a third kind that is equally powerful. Some people might say more powerful, which is filios between mom and son, between mom and daughter, father and son, father and daughter. Hugely powerful. So when you're asking about love, you know, it's big. It's, it's, it's filling you up right now. And... What the Bodhisattva has probably is none of those. None of those. There's another level of love that motivates the Bodhisattva where what? What has he or she been doing all these, you know, lifetimes? I've been a monk for 42 years, right? And I don't have a clue. I don't have a teaspoon of what the Bodhisattva has. The Bodhisattva has been working through the self. What's the self? The self is this way of looking at my life that keeps me separate from you. I look at, you know, I look at Tao and I go, oh, I recognize, I thought you were from Paris. You're from Holland. I know you. We've been to Europe in our delegation together. And yet still, 
I recognize physically, and we've, you know, been on trips together, but I don't know you. And you're outside of me. And I'm in here saying, oh, I rec- that's Tao, right. And Feng Tao, right? Feng Tao Trung. Okay. There's a difference. There's a gap. There's a distance. Okay, the Bodhisattva has been cultivating, 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 digging into, unpacking, analyzing, and erasing all the differences between me and you and everybody else. And the monks over here and the laywomen here and the everyone. To the point where in his or her reality now there's no difference. They've returned to that place called Tong Ti Da Bei, same body, great compassion. We heard the four elements, right? Using the four elements in a 3,000 world. That's what the Bodhisattva has been cultivating and cultivating. So now, I'm assuming, when he looks out of his eyes, when she looks out of her eyes, your well-being and my well-being are one. Your pain and my pain are one. There's no difference. And so what is painful to you hurts the Bodhisattva, and they work to prevent it. There's no difference. Is that love? To my mind, it goes beyond love. Certainly beyond erotic love, where I want you, you and me, baby, together and together forever and forever, you know. And then when your feelings change, my heart is broken, you know, or my feelings change your heart. That's romantic love that wants to hold and cling. Don't change. We'll always be this way, right? That sells a million movie tickets, right? So... Nothing wrong with that. That's why I'm here, because my parents had that experience. You know, that's great. Hallelujah. You know, it's great. The Bodhisattva has come from that experience, but didn't stop there. He or she went on and said, I can see beyond the breakup. I can see beyond the frustration of loving someone and having them get sick and get cancer and die. I can see beyond the love of my son who went off and OD'd on drugs and I lost him. How could he do that, you know? And say, everybody gets old, gets sick and dies. Can I do something about that? Can I get people to wake up in the process of living to say love is wonderful and powerful, but it's not an ultimate dharma? 99.9% of the people in the world stop with that. And guess what? Old age, sickness, death, and suffering as a result. The Bodhisattva looks ahead and sees that and says, "Mm, I want something more for my mom, for my wife, for my kids. I want to be able to save them from that pain. And so let's go of it but doesn't become a loser, empty, cold, heartless. Instead, they become filled with this other thing called compassion, which doesn't end. There's no, dear John, it's not you, it's me. I'm not feeling the same, you know. So long, here's your engagement ring back, you know. So the Bodhisattva's compassion is full time the feeling of connection is deeper than that frustration of trying to cling to your loved one and get, bridge the gap, and it never works. So, does that make sense? I'm, I'm trying to make a case that if you can let go of romantic love, you're not a robot, you're not a piece of wood, and there's nothing wrong with being in love, but it's part of the story that this bodhisattva lives. More clear? Mm. (laughs) There's a great Netflix film out there called The Guernsey Literary and Potato Potato Peel Pie Society that describes this breakup that I'm, you know, telling you about. And it's a great movie, and you just, you know, and yet... You know how it's going to end. It's going to end in tears. Separation. So, Graciela. 
We need a mic. We need a mic. Dun, dun, dun. Hi. I, don't, I don't know if this is going to help or not, but I remember just when I start hearing, hearing those teachings through the years, I used to get it really confused. Um, I used to think that if I had this love or for Alejandro or for a romantic partner, in Buddhism it would seem bad. Like relationships, somehow I misunderstood that. Family and relationships was like a, a, yeah, a negative consequence or a negative karma. And then through time I realized that um, I started seeing, because the way I used to love was very clingy, like you're mine and if you leave me, I mean, I would melt. And you know, you'd always come, sometimes you see me in tears. But just, and as I was sharing with Alejandro now that when, when it comes to whether it's my son or it's somebody that, I care deeply for, it's instead of using, for me, it is having this really deep care for someone and compassion, but also realizing that things are temporary and things may or may not work. You can get married and something can happen and it may or may not work, may or may not work, or they may, may or may not, may or may not be there, but it's ultimately like when I care for someone, whether, you know, with the people in my life, but, but there's a freedom there that they can come and go versus before I used to attach Right. And there's this thing called like loving detachment. I love mm -hmm. you, but I'm also, it's like loving detached. And I kind of give you that freedom, which is a little, and I've learned to love or care for someone in a different way through my practice. That isn't like. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's. That's. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Can you apply that to enemies, even to Republicans and to <laughs> Tea Party members? And yeah, it's harder. Yeah. No, I, I don't mean to belittle that. That's great, Graciela. That's a lovely expression. Um, that song, Yashodara, you haven't heard this, Tao, you haven't heard us. We did Yashodara not long ago, and Buddha Root Farm too, where the prince is saying goodbye to his beloved, beautiful, pregnant wife as he's going over the palace to go out and cultivate. He says, Yashodara, I couldn't love you more, Yashodara. That's why I'm walking out this door. He's willing to let go of the temporary physical love so that he can get enlightened and come back and save her soul. He says, Yashodara, um, he says, uh, when I get free, I'll come back for you. That's his promise. And in theory, that's the promise of every left home person that we leave home in order to wake up fueled by a wish to help the people we're most closely connected to. But then over time you expand that to include others as well. There's a, a wonderful section of the Avatamsaka where Maitreya Bodhisattva talks about why he made the Bodhi resolve. And he says he did it so he could come back and teach his parents Brahmins in the neighborhood who didn't believe in the Dharma and all his neighbors. He wants to wake them all up. That's why, you know, and it's like, hmm, I get it. Maitreya is a filial son. So, yeah, that's, I, you know, I love the Buddha Dharma because that's right up front. This is not hidden. This is the motive for cultivation. And Jesus, I mean, Jesus of Nazareth is a wonderful appealing figure who uh, saves poor people and prostitutes and beggars and lepers and he heals people and he brings wisdom and calming uh, kindness to people that are overlooked by the power elite, the Romans and others. And he forgives those who nail him up on a cross, you know. That's an attractive figure, but I didn't find the path to following Jesus practiced or promoted by the Gospels. They said, lead a Christ-like life, and if you did, you would wind up in jail, clearly. You know, you would, you would be uh, probably incarcerated pretty quick if you did what Jesus did. So here in the Buddhist version of the Bodhisattva path, it's like, no, that's not hidden. It's right here. 
Kindness, compassion, joy, and serenity. Right? Manifest a body to teach people how to wake up. This is the highest good. Our eight-stage bodhisattva is just one beat off of Buddhahood. And what is he about? He's about helping people wake up, kind of as a secret agent, kind of undercover, you know, and motivated by love and compassion. Right? Jin Hosher? Yeah, Erstor Bodhisattva. Yeah. He goes down to the hells. That's part of our story. We, uh, Jin Hosher? If he what? Say again. Um, when she was a, a, a daughter, if she didn't love her mom, she wouldn't have become there you go. Erstor Bodhisattva. Yeah. Okay, so here's a scripture. Where do you want to find the Buddhist message? Go to the Buddha's voice. In the various scriptures, here's the Buddha telling the story of a bodhisattva named Earth Treasure Earth Store. And he says, this hero, hero of our story, uh, in the Buddhist community, was a woman who loved her mom and was afraid that mom had fallen and gave up everything she loved to make an offering to a Buddha so that she could find out where her mother had gone after death. There's philios, right? That's one of those three kinds of love. Erotic love, agape, eros, agape, and philios. So who can do that? Who can give up your stock, your stock portfolio, your sports car, you know, your SUV, so that you can make an offering, you can work the Dharma in the hope that you're going to find out where your mom is. By the way, if people are having trouble with the floor, please sit in a chair. We've got chairs all over here for people to sit. Don't feel like you must sit on the floor uncomfortably here. I see people who are struggling, and please put your, you know, use it. the chairs are there for us to use. Okay. So, Erstor Bod hold on, don't, don't go away. Erstor Bodhisattva, as a woman, makes a vow that I'm going to save my mom no matter how long it takes. Furthermore, I'm going to save every mom. Likewise, because I can appreciate how everybody loves their mom equally as I do. And that's what I'm going to do and became Erstor Bodhisattva. So there's like hugely motivated by emotion, but not clinging, not selfish, possessive emotion. Okay, so was the Buddha, was the prince a deadbeat dad? Is the question. That's a standard question every time I say what I said. And so here I am at United Religions Initiative. Uh, we're having a URI board meeting. And Rita Semmel, bless her heart, the godmother of interfaith in San Francisco. Rita, who is still going strong at 90 plus, right? Rita comes in in the morning and she says, Hong Shur! She says, I was touched by something you said at our last meeting, so I checked out Buddhism. You know the founder of your faith left his wife when she was pregnant? He was a deadbeat dad. Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Rita, it, uh, yeah, that, that's part of the story. Yep, yep. But, Rita, uh, he came back as the Buddha, and you know what? He made his son into a monk, a Rahula, who woke up and got enlightened. Not only that, he turned his wife into a nun, and she woke up, as he did to his wet nurse, because his mom died in childbirth. So these, and he, after he became the Buddha, he went to the heavens to find his mother and spoke Dharma for her to cross her over. So it was kind of a short-term investment for a long-term dividend. If you want to explain it in financial terms, you know. So there's, you know, that's not the whole story, Rita, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was a deadbeat dad by your 21st century, you know. He probably could have been thrown in jail. Hashtag me too, you know. Hashtag deadbeat, you know. But there's more to it. And he, you know, 
So I would answer that question in the same vein. But not, and so the challenge for the monks and nuns who leave home is can you be patient with the practice? What's it like being a monk or a nun? It can be lonely. You have to put up with sleeping alone. It's true. You don't have hugs, you know, the way you did before. You don't have a dog to scratch. So, you know, it's proven that dogs reduce heart disease. <laughs> it's true. If you got a dog, they're very therapeutic, right? Your hypertension goes down if you own a dog. Well, we don't own dogs, and at least if you could get a vegan dog, you know, no, I don't think so. So, you know, we're not going to be feeding that meat food to dogs. So. Now, uh, in Thailand, there are temple dogs, but they're not sanctioned, you know. It's not the monk's puppy. So we do without that, and it's not easy to let that go. It, it's not easy to be able to say, yeah, I'm letting go the hugs for a bigger hug, which is that sense of, hmm, what is the feeling when you turn your six senses back and discover that you are integrated and okay. Not only are you okay, furthermore, you are able to transcend that sense of existential brokenness that is part of the ego construct. The false constructed self feels broken. How many of us sitting right here in the bodies right now say, I am completely at home. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I am full and complete of myself. I hope so. I hope you can make that statement. Most of us have this longing for home. This sense of not being there. Bu zi zai. Right? We are bu zi zai. We're not ourselves. And so we seek that fullness of self in the embrace of the loved one. Do you find it? He snores. <laughs> He's underwear, need washing, laundering, right? She uh, isn't, she's elusive. You can't quite grab her. You don't understand her. She thinks differently than you do, right? So my point is, you can experience the payoff of being willing to let go of that immediate love of the family when you meditate and turn your six senses around. When you get to that place where you're sitting or bowing or reciting and your mind is quiet, there's a feeling of never before complete where you are one unit, and then once you're really one unit, you become every unit instantly. When you cut off that last outflow, you merge with not just male humans, not just male and female humans, but with every living being. That is zizai. That is, I'm finally home. I've found what I've been looking for my existential loneliness is over because why I never was alone. It was simply my self that made me think that I was lost. Right? When you can enter samadhi, you find your true home. Shrifa would say, De chi so zai, de chi so zai. Right? I am home, finally. No more loneliness. No more wandering. No more feeling of alienation. Man, oh man, what a feeling is that sense of I am full and complete in myself. Connie. Um, so in my meditation sometimes when I am able to actually turn my six senses around and feel less restless and, um, and calm. And I do have moments where I feel at home, but it, then it goes away, of course, when I get up on my seat or I start false thinking a lot. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. I'm sorry. 
a little so louder, please. I was saying th there yeah. are moments where I do feel like calm and that I don't need to seek outside myself, but then it goes away after a while when my, yeah. my thoughts come back, my false thoughts come back. So is it like that moment that you um, strive to uh, kind of get to or is it the, is that, are those the moments where you like feed in meditation where you try to get to that point again? Where I think you're answering your own question. So, um, well, I want and confirmation, for me, I guess. For me to be able to say, yes, that is the moment you're looking for, I would have or, to know what moment you're describing and I don't really, but it sounds close. Okay. So, yeah, the, there is, uh, the, if, if I had to say it in a simple sentence, it's there are payoffs for going alone. And the point of leaving home and cultivating the way is not to go alone. It's to be ultimately reconnected. We said one day, Shurfa, what's the highest state? And he said, great compassion. There you go. What's the highest state? So he got a jing Shurfa, great compassion. Tong ti da bei. You are complete. Same body, great compassion. And if you, you know, inside me right this minute, how many trillion living beings are there? Just amoeba and bacteria and viruses and bugs, you know. They, the, the me that I think I am is really not who is there, you know. All of us are just this walking community, walking ecosystem of critters, you know, and they're hungry. And if you don't feed them, ooh, you'll find out how many there are. I'm hungry, feed me. Why are you so cruel, you know? Jin Fosher has been putting up with hunger for, you know, all these days. And he's in touch with the living beings who want to be fed. They're there. So... Who do I think I am? You'll find out if you start to meditate. You get all these voices saying, you know, I'm going to die. No, you're not. Just sit still. I'll give you a cookie later. Maybe popcorn. Maybe Hawaiian popcorn. No, just sit still. You have to deal with all those living beings. And Xiang Fu, Qi Xin, you subdue your thoughts. Well, those thoughts are not all just ideas. Some of them are those living beings who just don't want to be crossed over. It's very esoteric when you actually get in there and start to work with, you know, I had all, all these days of bowing on the highway in silence, completely cut off from every living creature, couldn't communicate to anybody unless I wrote Marty a note. And I'm remembering being eight years old and being lost in a rainstorm in Washington, D.C., thinking I was going to die. And I'm bowing, you know, on the highway in Marin County, and it's sunny, and, you know, the, highway, the ocean is here. And my mind took me back to some terrifying incident when I was eight years old in Washington, D.C. It's like, where did that come from? And you just think, this is a, an amazing thing, being alive with the opportunity to put the Buddha's wisdom in my body, mouth, and mind, and spirit, and goodness. I'm so grateful that I had a chance to hear about bodhisattvas who are truly unselfish. Because, boy, as soon as I touch my buttons in there, I want, I'm afraid I'm going to die. I won't get any ice cream. You know, I want some of that ice cream. Oh, okay, story. Sharps Park. Anybody know where Sharps Park is over on the peninsula? Sharps Park is down... Near, uh, past South San Francisco. We were bowing, and uh, there's a golf course down there, and we pulled up beside the golf course for lunch. And uh, I had promised, uh, I decided that I was entirely too dependent on sugar. And what I needed to do was make a vow to stop eating sugar. And so it was, I was false thinking about this, and you know, well, that's probably a good idea, but I don't know if I can really do it. Why don't you be more compassionate to yourself? Why don't you eat just a little bit of sugar? It, you know, it, it's, you'd cut it all off, and that's not the middle way, is it? You know, 
going to, you know, arguing with myself like a lawyer, bowing along, false thinking about whether I should eat more sugar or no sugar. And, and so immediately comes a car full of offerings from San Francisco, from Gold Mountain Monastery, and we're there eating. And what was it? It was two apple pies, <laughs> right? Some jelly donuts, lemon and cherry, and strawberry glazed donuts, and a package of Milky Ways, you know, <laughs> full-size Milky Ways, the, the economy pack, right? And I happen to like Milky Ways, Mars bars, you know, Milky Way. And there they all are, and chocolate milk, right? And, like, and so my vows were not to mess with the offerings, stay out of the kitchen. That's why I have a Dharma protector, right? So he could deal with all of the stuff, and I could keep my mind pure and single-minded while I bow, right? So I'm out there bowing. And <laughs> What's he going to do with those offerings? <laughs> You know, and so sure enough, Marty had been reading my journal. I had been writing about ending sugar, you know, a sugar vow, no sugar, no more sugar. And so he said, oh, let's see. Oh, this is really nice. You know, uh, I'll take a candy bar for him and a candy bar for me. The rest you should take back, he said, because we don't, he's not eating sugar anymore. And he pushed it all back on the lap. On the you know, and, and so what happens next? Anger. And I'm bowing along and thinking, just, you know, he's cultivating for me. Why doesn't he pay, his, pay attention to himself? You know, he's just like, you know, totally cruel. What a crummy Dharma protector. And I'm bowing and having this anger, right? And sure enough, as the layperson takes the pies, I'm counting it, two apple pies, <laughs> All the jelly donuts, a uh, half of the bag of candy bars, and the chocolate milk, because we didn't back home with them, being refused by the Dharma protector. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to write a note to him. This Chevrolet comes around the corner at about 45 miles an hour on two wheels, wheeling around, and out of the Chevrolet comes a can of Pepsi aimed right at my head at high velocity. And just like a prize fighter, I slipped the can of Pepsi. It hit the tree behind me and shattered. The psh, like that, dousing me in Pepsi. If I had not moved, that would have been the end of my pilgrimage. And I'm like, there's my sugar vow. And there's my anger. And Marty was like totally unaware of all this. He's tidying up the, the, the Plymouth so we could keep bowing, right? And I'm having this drama and the Chevrolet goes <laughs> out of sight. And that can of Pepsi smashed against the tree and leaking on the ground. And it was like, uh, I don't, sugar is not the issue, it's anger. You know, greed frustrated becomes anger becomes stupidity. Greed, hatred, stupidity. There's the three poisons right there in front of me. And I wrote in my journal, that became the Sharps Park Pepsi incident from then on. And it was like, okay, just, you know, eat a little bit of sugar and be grateful if it comes. But anger is no fun. Anger will destroy good things. It's a poison, you know. And... So, wow, e, it's not sugar or no sugar. It's how do you respond to your mind? And I missed the greed, and it slipped into anger, and I missed the anger, and because I was bowing on this hot plate called Three Steps, One Bow, I couldn't get away with anger. The universe responded, you know, with the teaching. So... Now, was it a coincidence? Probably had nothing to do with my state of mind, but it sure spoke Dharma for me. Anyway, so how did that story come up? What were we talking about? I forget. What was the context for that story? Desire, I guess, something like that. So, 
Anyway, watch the mind. Emotion. Jerry. Can one accomplish Buddhahood without being a monk or nun? Um, yes. In theory. Can you let go of the child who you gave birth to and raised happily? Can you let them go and completely treat them like you would treat any other living being? That'd be hard. You'd be a bad parent if you were that way, right? So theoretically, it's possible. There are episodes... Well, let's talk about it. What if the one who becomes a Buddha is a transformed body there to show you, to inspire you, to make you fa putihin through the Bodhi resolve? Could be. Do you know who that person is becoming a Buddha? You know, out of a lay person's body? Could be a transformed body there completely to inspire you. But Buddhas are, they don't happen every day, so it's a theoretical question again. Theoretical answer, sure, it's possible. Every living being has the Buddha nature, all can become a Buddha. Jin Chuan, is it possible for a non-monk to become a Buddha? That's the question, a non-monastic. Ding, too late, okay, next question. <laughs> yeah. My, my sense is you probably have to look long. You don't look like, does it happen in this life? I know there's marks of the characteristics of the Buddha. They kind of live in Tushita heaven beforehand. They come into this world. They actually leave the kingdom, you know, and go forth, and they meditate, and they wake up. So there's actually a, there's a kind of a, a pattern almost to this process of waking up. But my sense is it's not like we look at our, this life and say, okay, I'm not a monk, therefore I can't cultivate and I can't be a Buddha, so just throw in the towel. So I can run a monk. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 I mean, as a monk, are we going to become Buddhas? I don't, <laughs> myself, you know, it's kind of like just try my best, you know, moment to moment. And if I know plant the seeds, then one day that fruit will ripen. So I think probably the question would be more like, can we make the Buddha resolve in our hearts? And if we make the Buddha resolve in our hearts, then that will be the fruit for Buddhahood in the future. Super good answer. Time to transfer merit. We're over time. Can you turn to the back of your songbook? Make a wish. It's also on your Dharma request sheet. When we do it with the banjo, we do it Father Cyprian tune. It's a much more boppy version of Dedication of Merit than the guitar version. So, But if a lay person can become a Buddha, then certainly we can sing the Catholic version of Dedication of Merit, right? May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light. Share the fruits of peace With hearts of goodness Luminous and bright If people hear and see How hands and hearts can find In giving unity May our minds awake To great compassion, wisdom And to joy May kindness find reward May all who sorrow Leave their grief and pain May this boundless light Dispel the darkness of their endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into paradise May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Do one more. May all 
become compassionate and wise. That uh, you're responding with the Bodhi resolve is a um, skillful answer because it's doable. Um, the Bodhi resolve, it's like if you can make the Bodhi resolve, who cares about Buddhahood? Because you're going to go last anyway. Bodhi resolve, if people are curious what that is, please join me on Friday noons on Go to Meeting, where we investigate the Bodhi resolve as explained by an expert in the Bodhi resolve whose name is Xingan Da Shi from the Qing dynasty. We do it in English. It's called the Chen Fa Puti Xin Wen, the resolve to wake up and express the Bodhi resolve. How do they get there, Jerry, from standing start? Send their... Okay, if you go to berkeleymonastery.org, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, no space, M-O-N-A-S-T-E-R-Y, dot O-R-G, you'll find the Reverend Hungshur Friday Lecture Series. Um, if you're in Australia, it takes you to 5.30 in the morning. Whew. 5.30 a.m. to tune in on Saturday morning. It's Friday afternoon here at 12.30. Some people are at work. Some people are at school. Um, we also, uh, the uh, organizers of the lecture series record it, so it's available as an archive afterwards. So that explains the Bodhi Resolve in detail. Um, Page four in this one. We heard about the four elements. Look at number six, zero six. Look at number five, zero five instead. Whoever stopped their thinking has also stopped rebirth. Once rebirth dies, then all things come alive. Find a puppet on a string and ask him his advice. Seek Buddhahood, apply yourself, you'll get there by and by. Here's the Elements 4, our first verse tonight. Elements 4, just set aside, attach to them no more. In stillness and cessation, you eat just like before. Everything's impermanent, empty, over and done. This is the great awakening of the thus come one. All of you Buddha Root Farm campers know you can sing right along, right? You've never done it before, you can sing right along. Orlan, we need to be in good voice, all right? Bring it forward, here we go. Ready, number seven. This vehicle is true, you can tell by my straight talk. Any doubts that you might have, just put them to the test. Go to the source and find the root, the Buddha certified. I'm not going to mince my words to make folks gratified. Number eight, here we go. 
This is the money pearl, a treasure still unknown. Look to the Tatagata, but find it on your own. It works in six uncanny ways, it's here and now it's gone. A single round and perfect light, now it's hidden, now it's shown. The uh, second line, the uh, third line, fourth line in number nine applies to tonight. Here we go. Five eyes purified, five powers applied. There's no way to imagine it until you certify. Look into the mirror, the image hits your eye. The moon in water you can't grasp no matter how you try. Isn't this beautiful? This is the Master Yong Jia who looked at his nature and saw it clearly. And then let us sing it, right? Sing about it. Number 10 is beautiful because it talks about those, what it takes to wake up, to enlighten to the way, Zheng Dao. And you think about the question about can lay people uh, become Buddhas? Of course they can, but this is a process. You have to look like number 10's description. Here we go. Ever solitary, they always walk alone. Together with the ones who learn to take Nirvana's road. Their tune is old, their spirit's bright, their style is dignified. Their face is worn, their bones are steel, no one pays them any mind. Number 11. The children of the Buddha live in poverty, they say. Their style is very basic, but they're wealthy in the way. They wear the clothes that no one wants, there's nothing left to patch. But in their hearts a treasure no millionaire can match. That's the Zheng Dao Ge. And what I like about it is you just sing right along, you know. You know what that melody is? Anybody who plays Gu Qin, it's the Gu Qin open strings. Bong do 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 It's those open strings. It's the pentatonic scale. Right? It's exactly what we sing when we do the Sharangama mantra in the morning. Let's see, how does it go? Da di da 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 di da 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 Let's see, a moving honored one. How does the Sharangama mantra beginning go? And your moving honored one, supreme Surangam appears most rarely in the world, extinguishing deluded thoughts from countless. It's right there in the Guqin, the open pentatonic strings. Ever solitary, they always walk alone, right? But even though you're alone, you're together with all those who walk Nirvana's road. Every Buddha has walked the same path. Fo Fo Dao Tong, right? So, lonely but not lonely, alone but not lonely. You're in the Buddha's family at that point, and that's an ultimate relationship. Okay, by golly, there we are. Thank you for indulging me with, I think it sounds good to the banjo, right? In that. Who would think? Who to thunk it? All right. Um, Remember the, the Peanuts cartoon where Snoopy says to Charlie Brown, I think every baby should be issued a banjo at birth, he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we uh, have, let's see, we announce that tomorrow our Buddha for e, our Buddha, our day of Buddha recitation has been postponed. Not going to happen tomorrow and also the one that happens in how many weeks? The next one was two weeks from now? 
is also postponed. We're not going to do those. So if you had uh, food ready to bring tomorrow to cook, please hang on to that, and we'll do it again. We, uh, we need to make sure that everybody is fit and strong to staff it. It takes a lot of resources on our side. So tomorrow, no Buddha recitation. And the one that follows in two weeks, also temporarily. Okay, Suzanne, anybody who... Valerie, if you know anybody who is planning to come, let them know tomorrow, no. Okay? They're welcome to come, but there won't be a fa wait tomorrow. So. Okay, what else do we have to announce? Um, I heard that Ajahn Amaro is coming to America for the Katina cel celebration, and he will be here on the first Tuesday in November. Yeah. Um, that means November, November 6th, Ajahn Amaro will be here in the monastery for the first Tuesday. People who enjoy his style of teaching, that's going to happen. Um, Ajahn Pasano is over in Thailand enjoying his break from the responsibilities of leading Abhaigiri. And Ajahn Karuna Dhammo, who has taken over, was here on Tuesday, for the first Tuesday of this week. Um, the Mendocino Complex fire, anybody got an update? It's still burning away. Kind of dropped out of the news the last couple of days. Graciela, what's happening with the fire? You can still see the smoke big, right? Last two days has not been. Yeah. How many? Sixty-seven percent contained. Okay, thank you, Susan. Say again. September is. They say it, it's going to take till September for it to be out. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Huge, biggest fire in California history. So, all right, Jerry. Yeah. Okay, Buddha Root Farm videos are now online. Where do you go? Dharma Realm Live. Okay, Dharma Realm Live YouTube. Buddha Root Farm 2018. Okay, anybody who wants to see what was said and what was done there, please do. Um, how many folks do you have a count for today? Uh, YY, 47. YY 47 from China. Uh, 49, we beat them. Not that we're competing. 49, great. And how many here in flesh and blood, including the balcony? Pretty good. Anybody get a head count here today? So, all right. Shall we transfer the merit uh, once again and see you all next week? Oh, I promised to say something about Ulambana. We will be setting up our tables here this coming week. Ulambana, the uh, annual end of the summer retreat, uh, is happening in the next two weeks. Today is the first of the lunar seventh month. Um, Two weeks from today will be the actual day of Ulambana, uh, and we'll be putting up our tables if people would care to make offerings. We'll have them here as usual. It's that time of year again. Tum tum kwai. Wow. Came around, got truncated somehow. So that's the time when we make offerings to save those who are hanging upside down. Chiu dao shan, they're called. You'll be hearing more about that. Ulamban, uh, from Madgayayana saving his mother, that was the big moment. And 2,500 years later, people are still inspired by his filiality. Alrighty, shall we bow to the Buddhas? See you next week.
Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Namo Dafam.